Hello YouTube, controversial outfit choice I know, but I just got back from football and I didn't want to uh, delay any longer in getting a new upload for you. I'm going to be doing today a new episode of Art of War and a really deep dive on shot calling. So I want to talk to you about different shot caller perspectives and what key situations I look for in, in war as to when I call for particular scenarios. And the idea behind this video is to really help your shot caller to be able to hopefully elevate their own shot calling. But secondly, also to help you in your own gameplay. If you can understand what a shot caller looks for in key scenarios, you'll be able to understand how you create those key scenarios, right? So I think that's really, really important. I'm also going to talk a little bit about my understanding of the game. And then that will be it for this week's video. As always, if you enjoy this content, please leave me a like and subscribe. It helps me to continue making New World content. If you haven't seen the Art of War series before, it's a series of all things war and New World. A design to get new players into the game or returning players up to speed. I will link the playlist in the top right of the screen for you now. We have plenty there. One of the most common ones I'm seeing right now is whether you need five resilient again. So I'm going to link the card and why you need five resilient for war in the top right of your screen right now. There's differences again between Fresh Start and Legacy. Fresh Start servers typically don't have as good armor, but Legacy has availability of better armor. But in any event, this guide series will absolutely give you all the information you need. And I stream the game regularly on Twitch. Twitch link in the description below. If you'd like me to review your VOD for you on stream, you can drop your VOD in my Discord. Discord link is in the description below. Let's look at this week's video. Okay, so this is what a typical point looks like in a new world war. You've got the center of the point, the capture zone around it, different segments, okay? And then normally within here, you have quadrants as well. So I'm going to include number and system for you here, just so you can see the quadrants that I would typically call. Okay, so in a new world war, one of the most obvious um, common errors that I see most companies trying to do is they try to set up their army to control all of this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to fill in the green zones as if to say here's here's what we want to control. And enemies try to uh, sorry armies try to go for well, this kind of POV. And against really good companies, you are just not going to be able to control the whole map. It's impossible because if you think about a really good company, imagine a company you're evenly matched, then actually you're more closer into a scenario where you only can hold fifty percent of the map, and they will end up owning fifty percent of the map as well. And this is a much more common scenario for people to be playing within. So the first thing that you should do as a, as a shot caller and a raid leader and people who make uh, war strategists is stop trying to control the whole point. Because unless you're massively better than the opposition, you're just not going to be able to do this. Uh, it's one of the most common complaints I see. Now, one of the errors when you actually try to control the whole zone is that you end up spreading your army very, very thin. And as your army gets spread thin, you can't take opportunities of clumps or holding particular zones. And then when the enemy creates key overload zones, and what I mean by an overload zone is when they stack more opposite more um, soldiers than you have in that zone, they will typically win that, and then that zone's wiped, and then they'll capitulate from there. They'll move into the next area, move into the next area. Okay? So the first thing I want everyone to focus on is stop looking to control the whole zone and, and take a more neutral approach. Now, in reality, we've got it as these four quadrants, and, and most companies play quadrants, so this isn't anything too controversial here. But the war won't always look like this. In reality, what most new world wars look like at the moment is the enemy will have a safe zone, probably in your top section, which will be their bottom section from their perspective. And you'll have a safe zone in your bottom section. It could be bottom left, bottom right, vice versa, wherever you'd like to play. But this, I would say, is, an, is a pretty normal setup. And what this means is, therefore, that these two areas end up becoming conflict zones. Okay. So you're not really going to try and push too much into the top right until you are well set as an army. And similarly, the enemy is going to have a hard time pushing into your bottom left because you're setting up your army to create this as a safe zone. Now, why is a safe zone so important? A safe zone is absolutely vital because one, it gives your healers a base to play around. Now, I'm not suggesting all of your healers play there, but absolutely you do want a place where enemy greatswords and assassins and deck squads cannot get into because it's too painful for them to get into. And that way your healers can be uninterrupted. And in this game, I'm one of those people that fundamentally believes it's it's almost impossible now to burst through an enemy heal. Like if a heal if a if a bruiser group has a sacred ground on it, has an oblivion on it, and a healer free casting on them, it's practically impossible to kill that group. There is so much value in healer disruption, and we'll talk about healer disruption in a moment. But ultimately, the safe zone concept is all around a way to get healers safe. And not only that. When you're in this zone, when you're playing top left and bottom right, and you need somewhere to retreat because you're at 50%, and don't forget my rule, when you're at 50% health, disengage, recover, and then re-enter the fight, where do you disengage to? 
Well, you can disengage either on point if it's available, or you can disengage to your safe zone. And in your safe zone, you should be able to potion without enemies jumping on you, find a heal, hopefully, from your healer, and then re-engage into your zones. Just because you have a safe zone, I don't want your, your groups to default to just playing in the safe zone. You have to be really brave and commit to these fights in these conflict zones, otherwise you won't hold a safe zone. So what we see from some players as shot callers, I'm talking we, I'm, I'm, I'm talking for the general shot caller community, I'm sure they'd agree with me. Uh, when you create this safe zone, players sometimes default a little bit into hitting that S key just to sit back here because they like playing here because they can't die, right? The problem that does is that gives up this space. So if you completely give up top left and top right and end up playing bottom left because you were being too wimpish, too cowardly to take the fight in those zones, then what happens is the enemy spreads into those zones and you end up losing control. And I'm sorry, when the enemy looks like this in three quadrants, you will eventually get overrun in that zone as well. So it's super important that when you are given a quadrant, you largely stick to that role. And if you can't play in that zone for whatever reason, you have to tell your shot caller before you abandon. Because if the shot caller expects you to be playing bottom right and you, you abandon bottom right and go bottom left, then bottom right gets overrun and you end up starting looking like this. And war is a gradual progression. And I'm going to tell you what images I look for in a war scenario when I pull up one of my war bots. And I'm going to show you how I determine whether this scenario is happening or not and what you can do to possibly adjust for it. But if we go back here, your opportunity then amongst the point teams as well is really to try and capture these zones. If all things were being equal, again, we're talking about a 50-50 split on the army, you can probably end up owning that much of the point and the enemy probably ends up owning that much of the point. So you're in this scenario, we could call these, we could shade these conflict ones as well. You're going to hold this much of the point, it should be free enter, you, and they're going to have that much of the point. Now you can step into their zone and that's a good disruption technique and we'll talk about disruptors in another Art of War episode. But disruptors are players who ultimately try to draw enemy aggro towards them and hold that to basically create overload situations for your army in other in other spaces and overload situations are really super key because in this game whilst you can get like a big 1v4 1v5 clump kill off they're so infrequent normally what happens is the clump with the bigger number wins ultimately speaking is typically what happens because more shockwaves rain down more grabs rain down more cc rains down it locks you down we're all about creating number overloads and disruptors are key to that if we come back to this model right here what you're trying to do in a war is you're trying to contest these zones and win them and then you're trying to move that contest zone further up the point and further up the map and what happens when you do that is you end up creating space now space is a super key concept that i see quite a few educational type content creators around at the moment talking about and i just want to talk about it a little bit because i fundamentally agree with this concept and not enough players understand the concept of space but when you push up as an army you create space and that creation of space gives you more room to disengage and heal gives you more room to look like you're holding the map when i see my army really suppressed for space then i understand we're losing that battle and we have to do something to adjust and we can talk about those two things but i want this visual in mind because this is what you need to understand you don't need to have all of these squares be green and you don't need to have all of these segments of the point be green you just really need to have one or two additional segments of the point to be green and you will be ticking the point so even if it looks like this that's a ticking point and that's going to be one even if it's looking like this that's a ticking point and eventually you're going to win it you must contest it like this so stop trying to win the whole point start thinking about how you can contest the 50 v 50, start spreading into space, and then we'll talk about how you convert the opportunity into the top right. If you manage to get into this scenario, okay, where it looks like this, we'll talk about how you then collapse on top right as well. And just before we get into this raid plan scenario that, that I'm gonna do as well, I've released a new video about Throne and Liberty, an upcoming MMO that's coming out in the first half of 2023. If you're interested in new MMOs and new PVP content, I'd highly recommend you check out that video. I've called it MMO Killer because of the potential repercussions I think it has for New World. That card's in the top right of your screen for you right now. Please go and watch it. But let's get into what I expect from the raid plan. So if we go back to that scenario that I just drew out on paint there for you. Okay, so here's what a typical uh, you know, illustration of that, of that map I just showed you here would look like. So you can have two quadrant groups in each sector, top left, bottom left, bottom right, leaving their top right clear. Now what naturally will happen when you leave this place clear and you end up with conflict here is, naturally enemies will gravitate towards this zone so you'll end up having people playing around here your deck squad can be positioned now let's talk about deck squad positioning you've got two options you can either play them here shooting across there to contest road which is a natural place that they'll have healers and that'll be a very nice place to play but alternatively where you're going to see their main source of conflict is 
I expect most what most enemies do is, of course, there's muskets on the wall, but they'll also have their deck squad here. The enemy deck squad will be playing around this area, really helping to contest their left hand side, your right hand side. And so where your deck group positions largely has to be in countenance to that, because otherwise this group is going to have a super hard time fighting a, a deck squad that is literally just pelting arrows into them like this. I mean, a six and five just won't be able to play there for very long. They'll get instantly wiped. So to do that, you have to basically use your deck squad to contest the enemy deck squad. And that's okay for a couple of reasons. One, if for instance, which we're going to, let me just draw this green to say, to say that this is our safe zone so that we don't forget that there. Okay, so this green square, which is our safe zone, the deck squad can do one of two things. If it ends up getting overrun with their assassins, they can instantly shoot at this zone and support your bottom left, which is absolutely key. You must keep that zone safe. And they can also play right side to be able to hit the bow squad, the enemy decks group that are probably playing around this zone here. Now, what do you do if this deck squad tries to play, tries to play around here? They can rotate as well. Just one thing I see with a lot of quadrant group players is you give them this raid plan and they will sit here and they will not move, even if there's nothing to do in their quadrant. These positions are advisory. And what tends to happen is when you do this, you will get quickly get control of bot left. You'll see a big fight front here and a big fight front here on top left and bottom right, as we showed. If you can win that fight, okay, if you can win that fight, and that's the key element of it, then you end up having green segments like this, and you'll win the point. Now, what can you do to really convert this advantage? To be able to be in this segment here, you must have got a lot of kills. And that is when you have, when as a shot caller, you see this scenario, you can then say, right, push into top right now. Really hammer top right and you'll get the conversion. There's a couple of things that will do. This will be a really hard area to overrun because they'll have a lot of protection here, again, from their enemy dex players. And their respawners, who will spawn in from here, will most likely try and support bottom left as soon as they can, unless you've got a key tick on point. So you're going to have a lot of players coming in this direction. Now, what can you do about that? You can use a couple of things. This, by clumping these people together, you've made them more susceptible to AoE damage. And you have a couple of really good AoE damage spells in your normal main roster arsenal. If you don't know what war roster you should be running from a meta perspective, I have created a recent update video for you on this. I'll link that in the top right of your screen. That is the war roster meta guide, and that will help you understand what type of AoE damage you should have available to you. The two main sources of damage that you have to target this zone is Path of Destiny and Ice. You can POD on this zone, and I'm a big fan of bruises not Path of Destiny on the point and targeting it towards enemy healers. The stagger will do one thing. It will stop them. It will interrupt their cast time. It will also cause some stamina exhaustion impacts to lower their stamina recovery. It will also cause some nice damage because they're light players. And you can also cake this area in ice storms as well to really slow the enemies. And if you have unending Thor on your ice corner, that slow will persist for two seconds even after exiting the ice storm. And so therefore your enemy dex players can really jump on these guys who are super slowed. So it's really, really nice. And then if you even got to the point where you actually end up winning this zone and turning it green, then all you have to worry about is the respawners who are storming this way. And how do you handle restorm, re respawners who are storming that way? You have to do one thing. You have to create a front. So these guys should push up. What do I mean by pushing up exactly? Just let me clarify that. These guys end up playing around here to really interrupt. Group three and four probably step on the point to help you, okay? Help you tick, tick fast. And you CC the hell out of this zone. I'm talking about full ice storms, full ice showers. Get your bruisers up here, disrupting their respawners. Get your dex players up here, moving up, hitting this zone so that you can control the respawn on the point, because ultimately you need to prevent people from stepping onto the point. And if you can do that, ultimately you will capture the zone and you will win the zone. Now this work, this is true for defense and attack. You have to be able to control these key zones and try to hold particular points of the map. Now let me show you from my VOD perspective how I analyze this. This is what I'm thinking about mostly in war and how I'm trying to use images during the war to determine where we are on this section of play. OK, so this was a war that I played for a friendly company that I mates with Sniffers. So I'm, I'm not I'm in Project Asylum, but they needed a shot caller for the war. So I decided to help them shot call. They asked me, can I help? And I said, yes, I can help. Now, I just want to they play a very similar way to us. Most PvP companies play a very similar way trying to coordinate a safe zone. It's not exactly the same, but I can tell you what I'm looking for in key moments of the war as a shot caller. 
and as a raid leader and where I'm trying to help understand what's going on. So this is a really typical scenario that you're going to see. Basically, this is the first move. You typically give up a side point. Now, why do you give up a side point? Because otherwise you have to rotate so many groups and it can collapse very quickly if you mismatch your rotations. So why don't we just end that element of surprise or that element of risk? Give up a side point. We don't need it. We can hold two zones far easier than we can defend three zones. Holding three zones or trying to is pure ego. It's really a sign of disrespect, actually, to say, do you know what? I can hold three zones. You're not that good. What will typically happen is this thing where if I draw the picture here, you can see the enemy is in a big front. They spread from fort to war camp, completely spread out. And your players will then need to match them. And you can see here, my, my players and sniffers that I was shot calling, I've commanded to do the same. And that creates this war front here. Now, we're really happy for the fight to be there because the fight's not on point. And as long as the fight's not on point, they're not capping. So holding that front away from the point in a defense initiative is really, really key. As an attack initiative, you want to bring that fight towards the point so that you can start developing tick. And you can see here now, as they've wrapped around the point, particularly from the war camp side, at the fort side, we're really holding them, but around the war camp side, they're starting to really enter this area. Now, why? I've, in my mind, why are they entering this area here? This is their top, this is our top right and their bottom left. And they're probably trying to establish that as their safe zone. So you can see here, they've committed a lot of resources to really try and secure that area. Just going back to what I'm saying, most armies will try to secure a safe zone, a platform to build off of, okay? And this is what they're trying to do in this scenario. And this was a war against Badgers, so a very, very strong company. As we watch the development, you can see a couple of players moving into the right. But you can see they've now started to get control of this top right section. It's mostly filled with red players. This is their point group starting to step onto the point as well. And then we have a couple of disruptors here. We're going to talk about this role. And they're really starting to take this fight into our top left, their bottom right. They're trying to really contest this zone. If they can keep the fight here, then the fight doesn't happen here. And that's key for them. You want to keep the fight out of your safe zone. So actually committing loads of numbers in the safe zone is a bad idea because it draws enemies in. Actually, if you can move your enemy, if you can move your army out towards the contest zones, it naturally frees up the space for your players to come in. Now, why is this a nice space for them? Because their war camp respawners can walk straight through there and their respawners from the sea flag can also regroup here and then find their groups. That's a nice place to play in. Now, I just want to mention the disruptor role that we just spoke about. And people are trying to understand what that is. This looks like a bit of a crazy play from Candy Claws because He's in a 1v5, 1v6 situation, except when you actually look at this, who is he fighting? We have one healer, two healer, three healer. I don't know who the rub is. I know Cradle is another healer. So this is a group of healers that he's pushing into here. So it's not a very dangerous situation. The only thing he has to worry about is our dex group. Now, why is what Candy Klaus doing so powerful right now? Because all of this fighting up here, is supported by this group of healers down here. And if you can disrupt, if you can cause them to be CC'd, staggered, take damage, where do you think their heals go? Do their heals end up going to these guys here who need them from a fight perspective, or do they end up absorbing their own heals? Perhaps they cast the sacred on themselves. Perhaps they have to disengage with their rapier or their ice gauntlet to disengage from candy clouds. Now, when you do this as a disruptor, what you buy is a window of opportunity for your army to win these fights, to win these clump battles. And the, the army that wins these clump battles is the army that does the best job at disrupting these five players here. And five players is a substantial number of healers in your army. So you can see here that the Sniffers have established this as their bot left safe zone. Okay. And I have to say that Candy Claws does exactly the right thing in trying to disrupt this zone. You can see here he causes a shower. He's putting his oblivion down to try and take to try and take tick damage. Now you could say, why is it popping his oblivion there a decent idea? It's tick damage. Don't forget, all healers run diamond in their life staff. It's 15% on paper outgoing healing. It works closer to 12 or 13% outgoing healing. And in doing so, if you can chip away at that, that is a 12 or 13% reduction in enemy in healing output. And that's very significant. We get very excited about things like plague splitting grenades, which is like a 25% disease. Well, that's half of that for free. So if you can get on top of hitting disease cap, 50% incoming healing reduction and chip away at their diamond, 
it's like 63% reduced healing output, so very, very significant. Okay, so as I pause the fight here, it's kind of worked out exactly as I described. And, and I, do you know what? I didn't actually watch this VOD before I did the what art thing. So it could have worked, turned out completely differently. But to be fair, I've, I've been proven correct. This war looks like this. We have this area safe. And when I say safe, you can step onto the point and you can tick and your guys can do that absolutely quite freely. We have the major contest zones happening here. Not too much Nuggets is there, and there's not too much fighting in our bottom right. This is the key contest zone. Look at how many bodies are there. And then we have their safe zone that they're trying to create. We have a couple of disruptors. Point players will naturally step in to disrupt, but that's point v point. It's really being contested. But other than that, look at all of this space for their enemy healers to play. So that's developing as we kind of indicated. And this is very typical for an EU meta perspective. I don't know about AP or NA. This is very, very typical of an EU war right now at, at a Division 1 or Division 2 level. Okay, so as a shot caller now, what, what do I do in this situation? Do I think about, you know, do I need to send particular groups? Do we need to push up into their back line here? Do we need to secure our back line? I mean, from my perspective, this is relatively balanced perspective. When I, again, I can't see behind me. I will hopefully pan around in a moment, but we can see that most of their players here, we have most control of the left-hand side. Yeah, there's a couple of disruptors in, but that's okay. We look like we've got good control of the back line here. We've got a real good, nice baseline to build off. Having control of your back line is always very important because then it gives you that platform and it allows your respawners to get in without being interrupted, which is very important. It looks like the major front that we could try and deal with is that top left again. So here I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to let this situation play out. We're going to see if we can win the 50v50. I can see some of their dex players happening there, but we've got a nice back line. And now the war has really started to rotate into just two flanks. Or oh, now it actually looks quite bad. We're getting contested in bot right. We're getting contested in top left. They control top right. So now we're back to that original map we drew. Okay, of the point where we have orange, orange segment top left, orange segment bottom right, green segment bottom left red segment top right that's exactly what this war is starting to look like now it, it, exactly that except they're really trying to contest our safe zone so what i do is when i see this safe zone being contested i call my dex players if i can to come and support that bottom left it's really important that we control the bottom left now when again there's, there's a lot happening here so i need to get this over and done with um we have we're getting they're getting tick on point right now the worst thing to do is try and really just commit to the point and bomb this point hard because unless you can kill their healers right i can see they've got plenty of healers around here supporting them we're not going to kill this point group we need to be able to disrupt their healers so my shot calling here what i said was get control of the back line the whole army needs to get control of the back line point team needs to try and survive and slow down this tick as much as we can but our teams need to get control of our back line you can see that's what happens they're starting to try and get control of it. We have had to send some groups towards A, so it looks like we're getting overrun a little bit, but I do try and make sure that happens by calling that in. And you can see we've got more resources in our bottom zone, in our back zone, as we have. We have a couple of disruptors playing, and then we're just going to try and survive on tick. And I'm just as I let this play out, you can see we're not panicking to the point. We're not just all trying to jump on the point. And the worst thing for you to do now is if you jump on point and play very close, they're going to be able to nuke you so quickly because they have the number advantage. The worst thing to do is have everyone commit to point really early. Look, if you're at 75% tick, yes, get everyone on point. There is no, you have no time to waste. But in this scenario, we have actually a little bit of time to try and get a better opportunity around us. If we can have some more control, then we can step on and send disruptors in to be able to disrupt their healers. And you can see we didn't panic. We managed to push these guys out we're actually looking like we've got a bit of a better space now and we've reversed that scenario so again we're back to where we were bottom left is looking quite clear bottom right is a conflict zone top left is a conflict zone and top right has also turned into a bit of a conflict zone for us as we've got some point players there causing some nice disruption and what's happening with the point the point is de ticking because we've managed to get back so whilst we don't have control of the full map actually just being able to contest those zones and us having the advantage of Hicker and Tim doing a really good job here on top right, disrupting their point play. We're managing to de-tick the point. So please don't fall into that trap of, I have to control the whole space. I have to kill everyone. No, you don't. You have to hold space in certain areas and hold those conflict zones in your control. 
hold your safe zone at all costs. You must protect bottom left, then move into these key scenarios. Now, what happens for the next five minutes is a little bit of toing and froing. I'm going to skip to when I have to make the call to give up B. And the reason why I give up B is because it ends up getting overrun. Okay, so B gets lost at around 24 minutes. So we managed to hold two points for six minutes. And uh, let me tell you why I make this call. So we're looking at the wall here. And it looks like we're outnumbered, to be honest with you. It looks like it's not too bad right now. This is a rescuable situation, but we're in a bit of a bad way. Okay, so let's watch this here. Ah, so this is a really good scenario to understand from a shot caller perspective, okay? So you can see here that reds are contesting now. Absolutely. We have to draw this line. They have contest here. They completely, this is free for them. This is their safe zone. They completely control bottom left. This zone is being contested. And this zone, which is supposed to be our safe zone, is completely overrun by reds. And not only has it been overrun by reds, but they've done what I suggested you do earlier, which is tell your army when you get into this scenario to push up. And they've pushed up bruisers, greatswords, everyone into this big clump of healers behind. And that is really difficult to play now. This is going to be a really tough situation to recover from because we don't have any space here. So actually, by contesting these zones and pushing up at the right time, you can create this scenario where the tick is going to happen. And this could have happened because we over rotated. It's A or War. I'm not entirely sure exactly what happened here. But as a shot caller, I'm seeing this scenario and I know I've got groups coming back from A. So I just tried to hold on and let this situation play out. Can we get groups come and do a big nuke and then we step on? I'm not seeing the groups. I keep on looking and I say, right, we're gone. Why don't I just throw everyone on point there? Because if you look at my army, I know that this is healers and dex players. I've got a couple of bruisers and I have some point team players. But really, simply speaking, these guys stepping onto the point, they're just going to die. I mean, there's no reason for us to hard commit here because we can actually do a better job in trying to preserve A. And the worst thing you can do as a shot caller is hang on to B at all costs. Or just hang on and play this until it all the way goes down. Because what happens here is if you try to throw everyone on point, they nuke you, you end up back at respawn in four, and these guys move straight to A. They get position on A before your respawners get time to come out of the map and contest. And then they're already way up the road, and you're going to have such a hard time. So the best thing to do is not hard to commit to B as a shot caller, is when it gets to this zone and you identify this scenario, say, right, abandon and we move. We're going to get the head start on the army. We're going to get first mover advantage by making sure we can get there. So whilst the enemy has some players there, we're sending the full army. And we're in a situation now where we have an enemy group here, okay? And we have enemy groups here, and we're sandwiched in between. But that's okay. If we can now all jump on these guys and kill them, then we will create a new front for the army, okay? And that new front will be here. So again, we'll, turk, we'll, we'll end up reverting back to that original situation we had on B, where we had this front here, just away from the point where we have allies, okay? And then we have enemies. And that's a nice front to be in. We can get some control on B here. And now, as a result of that call, we end up holding on to A for a little bit longer. We'll let this situation play out as I'm talking to you there. But really importantly, you just need to put your CC down. Do I even get away? I got jumped on by quite a lot of great swords. But yes, it looks like I managed to get away, thankfully. You can see here, what do they try to do instantly? They try to, again, get control of this top zone. And we end up with a major front along here with us controlling our backline, them controlling their backline. It's very clear that that's their strategy here. And you can see here where, again, we've got lots of presence on the bottom left side. We do have a disruptor and send nukes. We have a major conflict area here, top left. We don't have too much in bot right and we don't have too much in their top right. Their top right absolutely looks like, look at all of this space that they can play in. This is all safe. This is why I call this their safe zone. We have lots of space down here to play in apart from a couple of disruptors. Here there is no space whatsoever. It's pure conflict and we've got a little space here. So at the moment, the map looks like this is the conflict zone. This is the front here that we're fighting in. Okay, and everything here else is fine. But as I watch this, as I look, we have way more blues in their half okay one blue 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 okay just to iterate the point we have 
several players, at least 10, if not 15 players, in front of the conflict zone line. Where do they have their players? They have one that I can see, and they've got a couple behind me, as I hopefully pan the camera around in a minute to take a look at what's happening behind me. Once I get my abilities off here, I'm going to be CC'd. I end up turning, seeing here, and again, we have this. So from a shot caller POV, even though we're losing this, I'm thinking we're going to get control of this zone back because we own about 70% of the map and they own about 30% of the map, which means we're going to end up de-ticking pretty quickly. Now, as I look here, A is kind of, they are ticking it slowly. What happens here is they try to jump on point really early because they think they have control. It's a misplay from them. They do not have control. And at this point now, I'm starting to say, right, we actually own this zone and we can do something about it. As the situation plays out, they're quite heavily cramped. They're starting to send people into our safe zone, into our bottom left. And we don't have anyone else in, our, in their safe zone. But I make a call here, which is I send loads of players. I send our decks group to really look at bottom left. And you can see here we have a lot of players bottom left. We have a lot of support. We're really going to try and nuke these guys down. Because if we can nuke these guys down and wrestle back control of that zone, then that's okay. And they end up losing this fight in top left because they don't have their deck group supporting them because they committed a bit too hard to our safe zone. And because we're contesting them, as you just saw there, lovely Adriano doing a good job. Bruiser's here contesting. I'm coming in for a little bit of support. We can wrestle control of that zone back. So it's really key you have control of that zone. Now, when we're going to forward to the point where we lose A, you're going to see that actually we lose control of that zone. And that's a major factor for it. <clears throat> okay so this is the moment i think where we lose a so you can see we hold it for almost 15 minutes here and the issue starts to come it looks relatively finely balanced right now this could be a situation where anyone could start ticking or de-ticking but what's going to determine how who wins this here is going to be how many bodies you can survive and how many clumps you can wipe and it looks like when we start to continue this fight here that they are starting to win the fight. So you can see on point, they've got substantial more numbers than us. We don't have many other players that we can get on point. So even though we're calling for people to get on point, we just don't have the control. When you look here now, you can see really evidently that they've won because they've managed to push up and take that space. You haven't got to control this zone necessarily. Have a couple of disruptors like James Dean is doing a good job disrupting the healers. And because he's disrupting the healers, they're winning the fight on point. And then they've pushed up into this zone. And from here, they own pretty much the map. So again, you don't have to end up controlling. Some people try to control this bigger zone. Okay, I'm going to draw it in blue for you just to illustrate the point. Some people end up trying to control all of this space, and you just don't need to control all of this space. You just need to control this space. And in fact, you only need to control this, this, this. You don't even have to control this. But when you end up controlling three segments, you end up controlling all of it. It's a natural consequence, okay? Just letting that situation play out for you so you can see. You end up losing the point. Now, why don't I get off point here? Why don't I get back to four? Well, there's no, you might as well play super aggressively here because you can reverse this scenario, but it's worth dying there to try and hold off as long as you can. Cheeky teabag from Bunce there. Despite that, he loses the war and he has an absolute terrible performance. So imagine that guy. Now, four to a little bit of a different scenario. You don't get into this top left, bottom left safe zone area. It's a bit of a different situation where everyone plays close to the point. But when do you tell your army to play tighter to the point and when you tell your army to spread them out to the gates? I'm going to explain that for you right now. What I can see here is that Seagate looks like it's got overrun and there's a lot of space coming in here. And this enemies have effectively pushed straight into our dead zone. We've got good control of this side because we have so many players here. This is their point group, but we've really lost control of that zone there. And that's a bit of a problem because of this Sea Gateway. So what happens, thankfully, is we get a nice respawn timer. This is the defender's advantage starting to play out. And we say, can you make sure you clear them out? Now, ice showers on gates are absolutely one of the most fundamental things. And it was the one thing I constantly reminded sniffers to do the whole time, which is I don't care as an IGVG, if you even see this scenario going on, if you know respawners are coming, what you must do is you must abandon this fight and go to the gate and ice, and ice shower it. Now, thankfully, who is that guy there? Who is that guy? 
That guy there is Sneepo, and look at what a good job he's doing. He's solely focused on getting the shower off on those guys and helping to repair B Gateway. He's Sometimes you get so lost in looking at what's happening here, you can't lose control of the gates as a defender. It's a huge advantage to be able to do so. Good shout out to Sneepo there for really making sure that happens. But what is you can see what's happened here is we've managed to kill so many players around the point. And at this point, I instantly tell the guys, get back out to kill everyone in and get out. Now, what badges do is they send people up, and I'm a very big fan of this strat. Not the whole EU New World community believes in this strat. I don't know why. I think going upstairs is absolutely amazing for a regroup. Why? Because when you look at badges in this scenario, they have no one inside the fort. Okay, they've got Scotsman who's about to die. Nuggets will almost certainly die because we're all about to turn on him. And then they have a couple of options. They're in maybe a 40 versus 20 scenario. They have no right to win a 40 versus 20. They will lose it 100%. So you have a couple of options. Do you let everyone die and regroup outside? Or do you send people up? Now, I'm a big fan of sending people up. Now, why do I like sending people up? It's a couple of reasons. End up taking this fight up here. If you're upstairs, you can change what is a natural choke point, which is the gates, into a natural choke point for the defenders by showering. As I get my pen back out, by showering these stair sections here, okay? And in doing so, if you get up and you have mages, you can also spend time destroying the shops and the repair generators to disable the enemies being able to buy cleanse and extra repair parts. So this, we, we end up not being able to kill these guys because we have to commit to the gates. And it, it gives us a tough choice around, do we push up and hit these guys? Or do we actually just let them play there? Now, they kind of jump down. I don't think it was the right play to jump down. I think that was completely the wrong play to jump down, and they end up getting massively wiped. They absolutely should have stayed up there and given us a much tougher time, especially because if they were waiting for their respawners, they jumped far too early because their respawners are not in the gates. They have to jump down when their respawners are at the gates and probably either help nuke gate or get on point because then they can actually develop tick, and that will turn the enemies from looking at the defenders from looking at the gates and starting to face in towards the point. So as a defending shot caller, you love to see this scenario. This is the best place to play. Keep eye showers here of 100% uptime. Make sure your IGVGs are talking to each other within their groups to get 100% eye uptime. And you should dedicate one person to each group whose job it is to not leave that gate unless they have nothing else to do and eye shower this at all time. And they just use their eye scorner to farm refreshing move so that they can constantly put down eye showers. Because the value in holding all of these people outside is so key. If you can do that at one or two gates and one or two gates ends up pushing in, then they get really, really isolated. And I can show them what that looks like on a, on a raid plan very quickly for you. Ordinarily, attackers will look something like this and you'll have defenders at each gate. And you should be eye showering these gates to stop them coming in. Now, if one gate happens to be breached and you can hold these gates up here, what happens is you will have normally a dex group positioned inside the fort. And as these players come in and they try to jump on point or something like that, they're isolated from their army. These guys can't get in because you end up holding them. And what do you think dex group do? Dex group looks at these players and wipes them. So uh, enemy gate phase is only really successful if you can get two gates in at once. If you can get a couple of gates in, then you can make things happen. But just doing one gate on its own is not enough. So as a shot caller, you love to see the enemy being held at gates because this is going to be super critical. So you can see here, just to play that situation out, Badgers have pushed in on a couple of gates. They've managed to get in back gate quite nicely, but we've managed to hold them outside B gate still. I can still see a lot of their players outside B gate. C gate starting to be overrun. This is quite a dangerous situation. They have got a lot of players inside, but have they got enough inside? All gates are being overrun now, so this is a pretty dangerous situation. You can still, still see there is some, some people being held outside B. Now that is huge value, holding those players outside B. Good job. To Jarvan and that holding James Dean and a couple of other players there for a very long time and stopping those players being able to engage in the fight. Now, what happens as a result of them being not able to engage in the fight? We can basically hold this fight here and these enemies can't push in too much. So we end up being able to completely wipe all of these guys again and push them back outside. And that's why you have to, you know, as a defender, your sole focus should be getting control of the gates. And as an attacker, your sole focus has to be get away from the gates and get in. This is one of the most critical elements of it. But I'm going to let this situation play out just so you can understand a few more of my thought processes. So again, when I look at this situation here, instantly what I'm telling my army is all of their players now inside the fort or right side, we're going to push right side and wipe them all. There's no point in allowing enemies to stay alive in the fort. You have the advantage of numbers. Kill and push all of the guys. And look at, how, look at my army here now starting to push across into these guys. We want to wipe all these guys and get them out of here because we've got the big number advantage. If we can keep the enemies desynced, we end up wiping a load of them. 
One guy's trying to go up. These guys are trying to get out. It's very, very difficult to get out. And we end up pushing all of these guys back out of the fort. And now we've got fort control again. Again, oh, we've got a group up here. Let's make sure we get the group up here. We, let, we don't leave any stone unturned. We're going to go and hit everything. You don't need to worry about too much. Let's get this guy killed. This guy dies. Push these guys upstairs. Fantastic. Really, really strong fort defense here from Sniffers. Cutting to a situation where we're getting a little bit more overrun again. They have good entry on C gateway, A gateway. You can see they're doing a fantastic job. The defenders here, sniffers, damage per second, etc. Doing a fantastic job keeping all of those guys isolated on the gate. And that's what I'm talking about. So what's happened is whilst badgers have managed to overrun C gateway and they've managed to get in through B, because we've managed to hold them outside A for so long, these enemies don't have enough players in the fort. And when this situation happens, you will end up killing all of these guys because they don't have enough everywhere else. The A gate defenders, they're doing a great job. Now what happens is we've killed so many of those players on C gate who managed to get in. Now we can turn our attention to A gate. Now again, Badger's trying to go up. It's the right thing to do in my opinion. We can't really contest this too much. I try and go and contest as a heavy player. What can I do? But you're going to see the amount of damage that rains in on me. So instantly it's worth dropping there, playing my life. And getting out and just causing a little bit of disruption if we can keep them up there that's good but they are going to try and hold that zone so you can see that natural um choke point that i mentioned here is the right thing now pullman makes a bit of a crazy play going in for that 5v1 i'm not entirely sure what he was doing there that wasn't the right play from pullman he should have sat up top with those guys who are playing right there this is the right thing to do play up top with those guys right and then when your army are approaching the gates then you jump down it's a little bit I mean, it's the right idea from Badgers, but they just haven't executed it particularly well. Again, constantly cause that disruption here. You can see we've got good control of the fort again. They're trying to breach phase now. That's why they've started to drop down. You can see we've got good control on B gate. We've got a lot of players playing B gateway and holding them out. C gate's got completely overrun, but look at the guys on A gate here. The heroes of this war absolutely are A gate. That's kind of unfair because perhaps Badgers created a massive overload on C by sending their respawners there, or whatever. But you can see the A gate people just doing a fabulous job keeping all of those guys outside. And really, that's what lets the badges attack down here because even though C gate gets overrun, we end up holding all of these players off, getting them killed by the looks fit, and then able to collapse with the numbers advantage. So there you go. <sighs> Look, that's probably, I just wanted to give you a snippet for one of the ideas around spacing, one of the ideas around disrupting. And the key things I look for is a shot caller to help me understand when I can call for particular scenarios to happen. And it's really important. I just want all raid planners and all shot callers to understand you don't need to control the whole space. You don't need to come over commit to point too early. You need to be able to create space for your army to play in. And when you win the spaces, you end up winning the wars because natural things happen, natural progression. As you go back to holding three of the four zones, what do you think happened? Eventually, you're going to win the rest of the zones. It's a natural progression, and you should be looking as a shot caller to see how is the tide of battle turning. It will ebb and flow, okay, across these zones. It will ebb and flow and come back and forth. It'll be a little bit more green, a little bit more red, and you're looking for that situation of where do I have to send my resources and why do I have to send my resources in a particular pattern? It's a pretty long video I'm trying to give you my deep thoughts and deep explanation here on, on all things war. I hope you found that video useful. If you did find that video useful, please give me a like and subscribe. It really helps me to continue make new world content and the Art of War series, which I really enjoy making. Of course, I stream the game regularly on Twitch. <clears throat> you can see my shot calling there. Twitch link is in the description below. And Next video we're going to look at in the Art of War series is a video guide on disruptors. We saw a VOD from Sailor Skin. Sailor Skin did a really good job on disruption as a bruiser, but Greatsword is really in the meta now for disruption. So we'll see if we can get a really good Greatsword disruptor boot, um, video for you, and we'll do a VOD review on that. As always, everyone, stay safe, keep rocking.